All right, I think we are just about ready to get started. Thank you everybody for coming to our grad admissions panel today. Uh, my name is Alexandra Pierce. I am a graduate assistant over at the Center for Career Development, working with students who are transitioning beyond UConn and recent <coughs> alumni. Um, so again, welcome. And just so everyone knows, this panel is being recorded. So if you have questions, that might be on the recording, but it'll just be the back of your heads. If anyone is feeling shy about that, don't feel like you have to ask questions. Um, I will definitely be asking some questions, but we also invite questions from you as we go through. So just raise your hand and we'll try and get your questions in. There will also be time at the end for one-on-one -on -one questions with these guys up here. Um, if you have things that you want to ask that are maybe more just applicable to you and your personal situation. All right, so we're just going to get started with introductions. Sure. So my name is Alyssa Shore. I'm the Associate Director of Graduate Admissions at New York Institute of Technology. Um, I'm actually a grad of UConn, so I'm a proud alumni. Go Huskies. <laughs> um, so it's really great to be back on campus, see some faces, kind of talk about my experiences, and I'm interested to hear the questions that you guys have today. Good afternoon. My name is Kristen Parent. I'm a Senior Associate Director of Graduate Admissions at Quinnipiac University. Um, we have more than 25 different graduate programs um, as well as our med school and law school admissions, um, but I work specifically with our graduate health science and nursing programs. So. I'm Meredith Richardson. I'm from uh, Case Western Reserve University, which is in Cleveland, Ohio, um, and I, uh, my title is the Assistant Director of uh, Admissions and Recruitment. So my specific programs that I manage are the Weatherhead School of Management programs, so business type programs, things like that. Um, I am Anthony Govan. I am Assistant Director of Graduate Admissions at Babson College. Babson College is in Wellesley, Massachusetts, about 20 minutes outside of Boston, so not too far. And um, we have um, all business programs, MBA, and specialized masters as well. Hi everybody, I'm Marcus Sanscom. I'm the Director of Graduate Admission at Roger Williams University in Bristol, Rhode Island, or right on the water, so it's a pretty spot. Um, and we have kind of comprehensive uh, 12 different masters across different programs. But um, if I could speak for the group here, um, I'll just say that I think graduate admission is a little bit different from undergrad admission in that you need to find the right fit school. And so we're here to be resources for you, not to be salespeople. So I hope that you'll consider at least grabbing business cards from all of us before you leave and feeling free to call us. And if you call me up and say, hey, I'm applying to Babson, but I need help with my personal statement, I'm happy to help you do that. I'm not viewing it as like we're competing, me and Anthony, no. So we want to make sure we get you the right program and use all five of us as resources throughout your grad school process. All right, thank you so much. Um, just kind of piggyback on that and get started. Um, what are some ways in which a student's application can stand out positively um, as you see it come across for one of your graduate programs? I'll take this one. Sure. Um, so it definitely varies by program and kind of what you're looking at. Um, at NYIT, we have a range of programs. I work with all of them. So when I'm reviewing applications for certain programs, um, we're looking for different things. But the main thing I would definitely say is, obviously academics are important, but you also want to see what you're doing outside of the classroom. Do you have internships? Are you working with faculty in research labs? Um, do you have any related experience? Are you a part of any professional groups? Anything like that that can kind of, that can kind of make you stand out outside of just your academics is really a great way uh, to show us you know, more of who you are. I would say also to add to that, um, be truthful. Uh, believe it or not, we, we can read the truth in your statements. Um, so sometimes what we see in your resume doesn't always match up with what we read in your as essays or the information with, which is provided in your letters of recommendation. Um, you know, we're, we're not out to be impressed because you fed us a story. We want to be impressed with you organically. So just kind of sharing with us your truth, even if it's something that you feel is a red flag and you're concerned, say you failed a class and you're worried that that's going to completely obliviate your chances of admission, um, it's not. Uh, but being honest about why did you fail, um, what was that experience like, how are you going to overcome that situation, how are you going to make sure it never happens again. These are truths that we want to see you've grown from. Um, so you can always uh, kind of put a good spin on, and emphasis on things without kind of trying ignoring it or covering it up because if we don't know your truth, we have to make the assumption on our own um, and you don't necessarily want us to do that. So the more truthful you can be and honest is always the best policy. I would just add to that, um, do, some, do some research as well on the, on the places you're going to apply to and, and see if there's, a, especially for grad school, if there's something specific that attracts you to that school. Speaking for Babson, where it's more of a niche, you know, it's a business school, but with a focus on entrepreneurship. So if that's something that interests you, you know, let that stand out in your essay. 
do not submit the same essay for every school. I've read <laughs> essays that say I can't wait to get to Bentley. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, you're definitely going there because you're not coming back. Um, <laughs> so make sure you do your research. Uh, make sure you take time out to, to find uh, some, something about the school that, that really interests you. An additional item um, relative to um, the specific uh, disciplines that you're looking at. Anyone that is looking at more of the health science um, or nursing, um, something specific that we often look for um, that hasn't already been mentioned is um, like healthcare shadowing experience um, is something that we place a lot of emphasis on as well as community service. Um, and so those are two aspects, um, particularly if you're looking at going into some of our medical, clinical, health science programs that we are sort of those extras that we look for in applications. Has anybody in here had a cold call before? You know what I'm talking about? Somebody calls you and you've never heard from them before. If you apply like that, that's usually a bad thing for our programs. Um, so I would say build a relationship just with anything in life. Come to campus if you can. Talk to us. Mm -hmm. Talk to admissions people. You know, most campuses' admissions folks can be advocates on your behalf. Uh, so if you've really impressed me on the road and the faculty haven't had that opportunity to meet with you, I can advocate and say this person's really passionate about the field, they've got fantastic communication skills, they're somebody that could really be, especially in a, <coughs> a program that requires internships, for example, to be able to, I can't show what your oral communication is like on a piece of paper. Your GRE score and GPA and all that stuff is it's important, but I can't show a faculty member that. Uh, we had a student that we met at a conference last year that her GPA was eh, her GRE was meh, and then we met her at the table, and if you had just looked at her application file itself, the faculty would have denied her. But the faculty member who happened to be with me met with her and talked to her for about 10 minutes, and she's like, I want that student in my lab. I was like, well, you know, she's a 2.9 in, GR in GPA, and she has okay GREs, and she's like, I want her in my lab. So that interaction, that relationship, set her apart from other students because we knew her. And so when we see an application that comes in, it's, the first, it's not the first time we've seen your name. That's a really big part in our process anyhow. Yeah, we are absolutely a resource for you. We are here to help you. We are not in the business to reject you. We are in the business to help. So utilize every one of us, and, and not just us, but every recruiter, every admissions person, every school, reach out, like you said, because our, our hope is to help you in every way we can. Um, but you have to make that clear to us that you're interested. You have to show us a little initiative and a little passion, and we will make sure that we can give every resource back to you. Great, thank you. Um, so we touched on a, a couple ways um, that this might happen, but um, maybe what are some more ways in which a student's application might stand out in a negative light? Or, you know, some schools call it something like a kiss of death. Are there any of those that you can share? Don't copy and paste. Proofread. 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 These are simple, simple mistakes. Even if you copy and paste a name, like you said, Bentley in an of absence, I see that too. Um, even if you copy and paste, sometimes you don't realize the fonts don't translate, guys. So if you, if you copy and paste, the fonts will shift and we'll clearly see you copied and pasted a different name over another. <laughs> so that's just an easy one to just be like, just, just write it from scratch, it's fine. <laughs> sometimes just attention to detail, just taking mm -hmm. that extra few minutes and making sure you know, your resume is formatted, spell check, some of the basic um, things can really <laughs> go a long way. When you have a lot of um, the programs that have many more applicants than spaces available, um, you don't want to do anything like that to cut your chances just by making a careless mistake. Yeah, putting in just a little bit of effort to make sure everything's in line, you've proofread it, it's really what you want to be is important because that's, you know, if we haven't met you on the road, that's what we're seeing. That's what we're representing you as. So you definitely want to make sure that's, you know, top grade A plus. Grad school faculty are going to be looking for fit as much as we want you to be looking for the right fit. So when you're applying to grad school, it's not like undergrad where, let's take the IVs out of the equation, the highly selective folks, right? So generally colleges at the undergrad level are looking for a certain SAT score if they're accepting them certain GPA and maybe you've done some extracurriculars, okay, you're in. So you meet certain thresholds. Whereas grad school level, we're reading every last word of your personal statement, which is why typos matter. Um, we're reading all of your letters of recommendation, make sure there's no red flags, and make sure there's support for the type of program that you're going into. And you know, ultimately, so we have one of our programs is forensic psychology, we also have criminal justice. When we get students, inevitably, that go into those fields because they've been influenced by the system in some way. They've either been victims of crime or they've been in the system before. And they often write very open and detailed 
um, accounts of things that have happened to them. Uh, and we recognize that that's part of their story. But where we've seen students go wrong is they haven't been able to take that story and then articulate it in a way that's like, this is how I want to do better for somebody else to use my experience to help other people. So we've had some students that have said, like, I went through a really bad sexual assault in the early part of college, really difficult for me, imp impact on my grades, et cetera. I worked through that, and now I want to join this community in forensic psychology because I want to help other victims from going through that same pain that I had. So it's a very positive thing. Whereas we've had other students who said, I went through this experience, and now I want to stick it to my attacker. That's why I want to go into this field. Faculty want to know that you're going to the field because you want to help people, you want to better the industry, you want to be good representatives of their program. All of these things are really critical. So whatever you're articulating, and we, we appreciate there are things that are part of your story that are not always positive, but being able to say, I'm going into this field because I want to make a positive impact on the industry or on people, um, that's going to really matter. And ultimately, you want to make sure the faculty can read that through the statements that you're providing to them. I would also say make sure you have real good conversations with your recommenders. Um, I can't tell you how many times <coughs> I re read a recommendation letter where they'll say, Johnny passed the class with a 98%, therefore I think Johnny is smart and can take your program. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. I see Johnny's transcripts. I know he's intelligent. That's, that's, I need more context. I've also seen letters where they say, I haven't had the chance to work with this student a whole lot, but they sat in my office and talked with me for a few minutes, so I think they're okay. And you clearly don't have a relationship with this recommender at all, whether it's professional or academic. So, you know, take every opportunity, if, if you're on the younger side, to start crafting relationships with those people, whether it's a faculty member, a supervisor, like a, an advisor, um, an academic, or if it's a supervisor or boss in your professional field. Um, really work on making sure you build that relationship so that way when they write a recommendation letter to you, you're, you're crying, it's glowing so much that they can talk to you about, they know your interests, they know where you want to go in your life and I can learn more about your passions and, and your personality type rather than just knowing if you're a, a decent student. Um, that will truly help stand out because um, most of the time they're very generic and even letters of recommenders will cut and paste uh, and I will get wrong names in rec letters as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's not something you necessarily have a direct connection with because you're not the ones writing the letter, but you really need to form those relationships and have solid conversations with them so they know exactly what you want and you know exactly what you're getting. Remember, they have hundreds of students sometimes that are writing lux uh, uh, LORs for. So be very particular about that part too. Don't gloss over it. One other thing I'll mention is um, for students that are coming right out of undergrad that are looking to go into a master's program, um, it's very be very careful to to be doing this as an adult. We see you as an adult. Grad school is an adult. Um, it's an it's an adult education. So even your parents, you know, you want to let your parents know that that the, you're taking this on, and they they can assist you, they can help you. But your parents shouldn't call five times on your behalf. <laughs> you should be calling on your behalf. Um, it's it's very important to to separate undergrad from grad school, especially when you're coming right out of undergrad. Some of those, some of those things at the admission at undergrad level when you're you know, 16, mm -hmm. 17, and then when you're 21, 22, 23, you wanna make sure you're, you're, you're separating yourself as ready for a grad school program. Yeah, there's FERPA laws that prevent us from actually yeah. talking won't, to your parents. Won't tell your parents we anything. We can't tell <laughs> mom and dad anything, so they're gonna get mad at us when really they should be having that conversation mm -hmm. with you having conversed with us. Okay, great. Um, I, the next question I want to ask is just get a feel for um, how your program values different parts of the application process. Um, if there is a particular piece of the application package that is most important, or maybe it's viewed holistically. So maybe you can speak a little bit to that. Sure. Um, so for um, my programs, it really varies by the individual program, what we're looking for and kind of what's most important. Um, you mentioned before that within the health professional <coughs> field, those mm -hmm. hours and those experiences, you know, with licensed professionals or within the healthcare system or whatever it may be, are super important. So for our programs like PA, PT, and OT, that's really something that we're looking for. We're also looking for really strong academics, especially within the required prerequisite courses, just to make sure you have that strong academic background. It's a highly competitive field these days, health profession, so really those types of things to really make you stand out are important. Um, and then within our other programs, something more like community arts you know we might want to see more of the writing 
um, background that you have and your professional writing abilities, your technical writing abilities, things like that. So when it comes to your specific program, you should definitely contact admissions so they can kind of give you some more insight as to what exactly is kind of looked for, what's most important, what we're prioritizing when we're looking at applications. So then you can kind of gear your ap application and your experiences to do the best in that sense. Definitely, I would um, agree with that wholeheartedly. I work with um, 12 different graduate health science and nursing programs. Um, one thing that is across the board with all of those are academics. We're going to be looking for strong human health science foundations in terms of courses, overall grades. Um, the programs that I work with tend to be some of the most competitive ones, and so um, academics is really important. Um, but almost all of the other programs I work with also do require the hands-on patient care experience. And so that's um, having that clinical experience is um, a key component to many of our programs. Um, one thing that I would advise if you're looking at all into health science professions, um, I work very closely with our physician assistant program and get a tremendous amount of questions about that. And um, if you are, regardless of whatever year you are in college, one thing that is kind of helpful to students now is to start an Excel spreadsheet and maybe list all of the possible requirements that the schools may offer on the top and then all the schools that you're considering kind of down the side and just make sure that before you hit submit on any of your application you've got everything lined up because um, there is not a uniform list of prerequisites across schools um, for applicants <coughs> looking at medical schools, there is a pretty uniform list of prerequisites, and um, almost every medical school is going to want the same curriculum, but that's definitely not the case for nursing programs, for PA programs, for occupational therapy, for PT, and so um, one school 10 minutes away from us may require very different courses. Um, some are going to want the GREs, some are going to want the GMAT, and so as many things as you can do now to try to take that extra course um, in your undergrad that might help you to be able to apply to a few more schools that, um, or as many things as you possibly can, just try to spend some time now doing uh, the research. Um, and it's nice to kind of have that Excel spreadsheet. Um, a lot of applicants ask us, like, how do I, um, like indicate the patient care hours that I've done, the shadowing hours. So again, I would highly recommend starting to log that now because you may not be wanting to apply to grad school for three, four years. And so those hours that you're building now, um, three years from now, you're like, so how many hours did I volunteer at that place? And so just taking that three minutes now to type, okay, I volunteered at this hospital for this many hours, and start that as a, a Word document or Excel spreadsheet could really help you pay off dividends um, when you do get to the point of application. So, so my programs are, uh, at the Weatherhead School of Management, mostly focus on business programs. We do have uh, MBAs and specialty masters. So it kind of depends on um, if you're a working professional and looking at the working professional programs or if you're non-working professional program interested. Uh, our particular set of interests is based uh, holistically. So no matter which program you have, we, we do try to approach it as, as even as possible so that you and the person applying after you are uh, reviewed in the same manner but we do place emphasis on certain calibers too so for example if you have like a 1.3 GPA hate to say that's that's quite low I'll still consider your application but it's one of those like yeah we, we, we have to be realistic uh, about certain calibers um, but we do look at things very critically like GPA test scores um, and some other indicators because statistically it's easier to compare apples to apples when we see numbers next to each other. So that's why having good test scores, having good GPA is so critical because you are up against other people uh, fighting for the same seats in the class. So we do try to review everyone so if you don't have good test scores, maybe your GPA isn't as high as you want it to be, maybe you have work experience, maybe you have um, a really glowing letter of recommendation or some other aspect, maybe your essays, your journey getting to here is, is just fantastic. So you're, you, it doesn't really have a set way of doing it because you are always different from everyone else, but we do try to look at you as comparably as possible. Uh, I would just, how many of you are thinking about PhD programs in the long term? Okay. 
and masters only, the rest of you are kind of in the middle. Uh, masters admission generally is a little bit more flexible. Um, it depends on the program, depends on the school, yada, yada, yada. PhD programs, for example, many of them, especially, so we work a lot with psychology, as I mentioned, so you might be applying to a clinical psychology PhD. They might be looking for five students to fill spots in a year, and they have a thousand applicants for them. If you're this group up here reviewing a thousand applicants, do you think we all want to review every single one of them? So typically what a lot of the more competitive doctoral programs will do is they'll, take, they'll say anybody who meets this threshold for GPA and this threshold for GRE, they make it and the rest are gone. So as holistic admissions has really become kind of a buzz thing in our in grad world, uh, and we're doing a lot of that for the most part, um, there's still just realities of how this works, and especially competitive programs, you're just going to be a number on a sheet of paper. And if your number isn't there, you're automatically taken off the table. So you could be glamorous in every other way, but those numbers are going to matter. So for those of you interested in PhDs, especially those that are freshmen or sophomores, you have opportunities to make sure you're building in the right direction. Talk to schools now, find out what they're looking for. If you need a plethora of research, don't wait till senior year when they give you a thesis as a requirement to do it. Do some volunteer research, work in a lab or something during sophomore, junior, senior year. Then you're building on a much deeper research uh, acumen for you. Um, I know that for our programs in research, we're looking for students who have not only just done the minimum, but they volunteered because that shows not only research skills, but it shows that you're passionate about what you're doing and that you have a commitment and a work ethic that's different from some of the other students. And that's where some of the holistic admission stuff really can fit in for all of us. So you want to separate yourself in that holistic way if, as long as you can meet those academic thresholds. But at the master's level, you might not have those same cutoffs. And one thing that I know can be a death knell for a lot of students that are applying, they apply somewhere, t they, they're totally, so as Meredith kind of talked about, they're totally not in line with the type of student we're looking for. Many of you will ask us, what's your minimum GPA, what's your average GRE, what type of student, what kind of background do you want? Most of us can rattle that off pretty easily. Um, it's the students that, I'll tell a student it's a 3.6 average GPA, not granted, average is an average, right, to so the people on either side of that. But I'll say 3.6 GPA, 60th percentile GRE, and so on. And then a student applies with a 2.5 and a 20th percentile GRE. It's like they're just not even in the ballpark, and they're applying to a program where they know they're likely going to get denied. We hate denying people, as you've heard. <laughs> so we'd much rather us be candid with you and say, this is what our program is, and then have you apply to the right ones so that you get acceptance decisions in the mail and mm -hmm. not a pile of denials. Uh, we had one student who was advised poorly, uh, who had a 3 8 GPA, he had like 60th percentile GREs. He's pretty solid, but he was not Ivy League solid. And he applied to only Ivy Leagues for his PhD. And he got denied to every single one of them. And then he called us in a panic in April, like three weeks before our deadline, and said, can I get in your master's program? And thankfully, we had a seat available, and we could get him in. He was really good for our master's program. But he was just devastated because he had five denials sitting on his table at home. So finding the right program and applying the right programs would really be helpful for you. Mm -hmm. It's like having conversations with us. It's very critical. <laughs> Great. Um, speaking of, I heard a little bit about some of the, the GPA and, and um, standardized test score uh, cutoffs. So can you speak a little bit to how maybe strict those cutoffs are, if they're more flexible, if it depends on the program? Yeah, um, yeah definitely depends on the program. Again, you'll probably hear us say it at least a dozen more times talk with the us, because <laughs> every program is different. Um, I, I uh, To his approach about the holisticness, he's absolutely right. We do try to look at you holistically, but real, but if you do not have the certain caliber that we're looking for, it's really just not going to work out. So if you have a, a 1.3 GPA, yeah, I'm sorry to say it's likely I'm not going to admit you, but just because you have a 1.3 doesn't mean that you don't have a chance in other ways. That's the whole holistic approach. But um, with our management programs, we have our preference, we have our averages, and remember, averages are just averages. It doesn't mean a minimum cutoff. So if I say our average quant score is in the, in the 90th percentile, that doesn't mean if you get an 89%, you're cut off. That means we average 90%. I feel like some <coughs> people don't, don't always process it that way. So if you have a 74%, guess what? You could still get admitted. Um, so it just kind of depends on what it is, what the program is, and the requirements. I know Generally speaking, we prefer you to have 75th and percentile and higher in, in our programs. Um, that's the best chance for ad admission and scholarship. So that quant score is super important to us. Verbal is, is usually a little bit lower. I don't know why no one ever does good in verbal. <laughs> um, so that average is a little bit lower. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, 3.0 and higher is also preferred for us. But again, if you get a 2.9, that doesn't mean you don't have a chance. These are just preferred ranges. So we don't really have 
minimum scores. So again, if you get that 1.3, you're not completely out of the realm. I will c still consider you, but again, you want to try to work with us so your expectations and my expectations are the same thing. Because if you if you come to me with a 2.8 uh, and a you know 30th percentile of test scores, I'm going to tell you it's unlikely you'll get admitted. Uh, and, and But if you have a chance to improve your test score, take it again. And then if you come back to me with 70th percentile, well, guess what? You have a 2.8. I might actually be able to work with that. Let's let's talk more about what else you should do in your application to kind of push you back up on the, the positive side. I would say, how many are seniors? Any seniors? Seniors. So that's great. I'm not going to ask you all your GPAs or anything like that. <laughs> but um, let's say you are you don't think you're, you're ready for a grad program or you don't think you're GPA and you really want to go to a specific school. So for Babson, I can speak, you know, it's number one in entrepreneurship. We have people that want to start their own business. And maybe they didn't do that great in undergrad. And, they, you know, they don't meet the, the average GPA or the average test mm -hmm. score. What you can do is look for other programs that might fit. So working professional program. Those scores don't matter as much if you have eight years of work experience. So maybe you're not ready right now, but you know, you like, I want to start my own business, but go work, go get some work experience, because the work and professional programs, I'm speaking for BAPS and not for everyone, but you know, yeah, your GPA, it was 10 years ago, so maybe we don't apply as much weight to it then. Your work experience is more important. How mm -hmm. fast did you get promoted? How are your professional recommendations? So even if you're senior, junior, and You've had a tough time in undergrad, but there's a school you really want to go to. See if they have a, a program that takes other things into account, like work experience, or maybe maybe they waive the GMAT for a certain criteria, and you don't even have to take it. You're not a great test taker. Who thinks they're not a great test taker? Because I hear it all the time. No one's right? a great test taker. I'm not a great <laughs> test taker, right? <laughs> no, so I feel that. so you know if you're if you've taken the GMAT a bunch and you're not getting the score you want, you know go into the workforce, do well. Um, in your career and then come back and apply then and those things don't have <coughs> that's just one thing it doesn't have to be you know I'm a senior I did terrible I can't go to grad school it's, it's not true not at all we definitely do take a look at academic trends so mm -hmm. if you had a rough freshman year a lot of people have been there faculty who work for us have been there too <laughs> so we understand that and we appreciate that students kind of grow and mature and kind of find their passions as they go through college so don't beat yourself up over your freshman and sophomore grades but just absolutely knock it out of the park with the end of your program and for some students that means continuing to take some classes post back to really show that that upward trend is continuing and would continue into grad school. And um, so we do for all of our graduate health science programs, in addition to looking at your overall uh, GPA and your science GPA, we also look at post back credits. And so that is another opportunity where you can really prove to an admissions committee that I'm really ready to handle the rigor of graduate school. And um, so all you can do is try to improve um, and show what is truly indicative of your ability. My freshman year was not, but this is who I am now, and I'm going to do really well in these classes to show you that I'm capable of that. Um, often if you are taking some post back credits because you're in that situation, um, try to take more than one class at a time. Um, because just chipping away at classes one at a time doesn't show an admissions committee as much that you're ready to handle a rigorous graduate program. Um, most of the health science programs that I work with are full-time programs, so they're very, very intensive. And so um, it doesn't show as well that you can handle volume and intensity if you're just chipping away at one class at a time. Now if you did really well in your undergrad and you're just needing to take one or two classes as prerequisites, that's a different situation. It's fine to take one or two at a time in the evening or with your work schedule um, or whatever you need to do. But um, as many things as you can show to kind of that you're ready for this next step in your transition to grad school. Um, will help an admissions committee in being able to advocate for you. Kind of branching off of the post back thing, um, for us when it comes to test scores for certain programs like our engineering, um, with the GRE, if like your GRE is a little bit low or your GPA is a little bit low and you're not quite there for where you need to be, what we could sometimes do with students is allow them to start taking um, courses as a non-matriculated student. So we'll have you take two courses a semester and see how you do. And let's say you have, you know, you excelled in those classes, you have a 3-7 in those, you know, we could then maybe admit you for the following semester. 
So that's why it's also important to come to speak with admissions. We can kind of tell you about different options like that. If you're just a little bit below that threshold, we still want to work with you. We want to get you in the program. We want you guys to succeed. So definitely, you know, definitely reach out and speak with us because there are other options like that. I'm going to share a secret with you. GRE and GMAT are tests you have to study for. Did anybody go in and not study and take them? <laughs> And, let, and I'll tell you, I've, there's a lot of students that take them twice and they blow 400 bucks real fast because you get paid 200 bucks a pop for the GRE or whatever it is mm -hmm. now. Um, and they get scores that are like 10 points difference on the second one. And it's just, there's, there's no evidence that I've seen anyhow in our programs that anybody scores dramatically different unless the first time you literally woke up and just went and took the test and never studied for it. And now all of a sudden you've studied and you get a dramatic difference. So typically, I'm not advocating that students take the GREs twice or GMATs for twice if you can avoid it. If you have to, fine. <coughs> uh, but you want to study like hell for these things. I mean, w I can't underscore that enough. Uh, and that's not to scare you guys, but especially those of you going to PhDs, the GREs matter more than any of our other programs do. Um, so you really want to score well with these things. And half of the GRE is the content, and half of it is the stress of the damn thing. Because mm -hmm. you've got to go through, it's timed, it's on a screen, it's a lot of questions, the formats that you're not used to. If you took the SAT, it's relatively similar in some ways. Um, and it's all the math section, the quant section. So anybody going to research, the quant's going to matter a lot. So that's a tip. Study like hell for that part. Um, the quant section is largely trig, geometry, calculus, stuff that you're probably not doing regularly in college for most of us. Some of you, engineers, are probably doing it more regularly. But many of us have not touched it since high school, so you really need to study a little extra to make sure you do well in those sections. So uh, don't go in there cold. Don't expect to just score well and you've got this, it's easy and all that. It's not going to be that simple. And these GREs mean the difference of admission, and they mean the difference of scholarships in many cases. Big 10. So um, you don't want to miss out on 10 grand because you just blew off studying for an exam. So um, take it seriously. And also, they're good for five years. So if you're like, eh, I'm not going to go to grad school for two to three years, well, take it while you're now. used to study <laughs> and you know how to yeah. do it. And it's, you know, and then it, it's good for five years. So you can mm -hmm. hold on to it. And then when you forget everything that you learned in undergrad, at least you have your GMAT done. <laughs> What is the best piece of advice you can give students for writing an effective personal statement? I'll start with this one. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> all essays do not fit all schools, right? So we, on purpose, make our essays specific to the school. You know, you'll have generic stuff like long-term goal, short-term goal, but at Babson, we're going to throw into something like simple as why. Why Babson? You know, and that's the part where you want to say something about the school or doing some research or applying something the school stands for, um, usually the learning goals or something like that, and applying it to something you've done. So definitely take the time to do your research. That's all. Yeah. You even throw in a faculty member name, but only one that you actually know and yeah. did some research <laughs> on. There's a few faculty that we have at Case Western Reserve University that have won massive awards. In fact, one of our professors has uh, the most awards, uh, uh, which is eight, out of any other faculty member at our school, and he's just phenomenal, and unfortunately he's going to be retiring soon. But people call him out because his research is so well known. And so when they put on not just his name, when they mention, oh, and I cannot wait to, to study under Professor Solo because of the work he did on blah, 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 I, I know that that student has researched this school, and it's, it doesn't feel false. Uh, I can tell if it feels false. Um, but yeah, you, you, as what I spent, uh, mentioned earlier, speak your truth. You know, um, take this opportunity, again, same thing. I want to know what your career goals are. I always say, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Tell me your past, your short-term, your long-term goals. Why is this program going to be the way that gets you there? But I want to know more about you. I want to know what, what makes you human, what makes you... Um, you know, how are you going to contribute to the class? How are you going to give back? This is a two-way street. It's as much as we need to be a good fit for you and you a good fit for us. Uh, you know, how is that? How does that uh, work exactly? What is this in your eyes? Because sometimes I'll read something and go, "Oh, this is not at all what this person. We're not at all what this person thinks they are." Um, but owning up to your truth and being honest about everything. Um, again, admit, admitting faults, which I said earlier. Um, all of that is true, and, and Anthony's right. We have all different essays. So the way that I ask, what are your short and long-term goals, versus the way that Anthony's school asks, what are your short and long-term goals, 
may not actually be the same question. So just because you answer my essay doesn't mean the way you answer his essay is going to actually be the same approach. You might be answering the same question, but the way in which we ask our questions actually are different. We're actually we're trying to get a specific answer from you for what we need. So sometimes I'll read something and think this is way too generic because I realize you guys are trying to write uh, one essay to cover a variety of schools. We get that. We understand you're busy, you have a lot of things to do in limited time, but those that take the time to craft the essay specific to the way that we ask our questions are really going to stand out to us because then I feel like I'm reading your truth. And don't do the buzzword thing too no. where you just look up a bunch of words that go with Babson and just put them in there because I can see it from a mile away. They're like, I'm interested in entrepreneurship, sustainability, and I'm like, you didn't mention that anywhere else. It's like at the end of the essay, you just looked up what Babson is about and put those in there to try to make a connection. We can tell when the connection is real because mm -hmm. it's going to come through through your recommendations. It's going to come through through your volunteer work, your resume, whatever. We're going to piece it all together. Yep. For doctoral programs, you're going to probably be required to identify a faculty member, most likely. So I was saying, like, I'm working in X person's lab. So that'll be part of your application process. In your letter of intent, um, you should always mention faculty if you have an interest in research that's happening there. And just to take it a step further from what they were suggesting, if you know there's a specific research project they've done or that they're currently working on, talk about that specific research. So, you know, we've got a faculty member that does re um, research on recidivism. So people going back in the system after they've already been incarcerated. So when we have a student go, I want to work with Dr. DiCataldo because he's working on recidivism, and I want to work with juveniles that have been entering back into the system, that underscores that the student's done significant research about what's happening in the program. Not just like, Dr. DiCataldo's a cool guy, and I know he's working as a forensic psychologist, but he's doing this. So be, to be able to say there's specific research that you like, I think is one way to take it. And to kind of underscore, you know, as far as talking to people, uh, we talked about before, if you're in volunteering in labs and working, uh, doing research now, and you're working with people that are well known in the field, you're building a network that then extends typically beyond the walls of UConn. So, um, for example, we had a student that applied from the University of Illinois at Urbana, um, worked in a lab, uh, or actually Chicago, um, worked in a lab with a woman called Betty Bottom. She's a very well known researcher in psychology, and our faculty saw that she worked with her, and it was like the rest of the file didn't even matter. They were like, she worked with Betty Bottom, she's in the program. So there are certain networks that if you build them now in your undergrad, that just by them picking up the phone and saying, hey, my student's applying to your program, that's going to put you at the top of the pile. So mm -hmm. networks are going to be really valuable to you, too. Um, speaking of kind of off of that, um, is there anything when you look at a student's resume or CV that will make them stand out? Um, so a lot of students who come into our office who I've spoken to about applying to grad school say, you know, should I go right away from undergrad or should I get some work experience? So can you speak a little bit to the value that's placed on those things? I think professional experience, again, depends on the program. I know I keep saying that, but it really is true. Um, but having related experience, having a wide range of experience within your field, um, within the health professions, like I said before, you know, if you're looking to be a PA, you know, you have experience working with children in pediatrics, you have experience working with older adults, you know, you've done some uh, mental health counseling, things like that, just to really, you know, broaden your experience. It shows that you, you know, are t taking initiative to be involved, to expand your knowledge. Um, it shows that you're really dedicated to this field to kind of learn as much as possible. Um, so really just, you know, gaining that experience, making it, um, you know, as widespread as possible, but also, you know, making sure it's solid experience. You know, we don't need to see that you uh, were a swim instructor um, when you were in ninth grade and you're now applying for an engineering program. Like, that has no relevance. Um, you definitely want it to be something that's relevant. We want to see what you're doing as adults. We don't need to see what you're doing as high school kids. So definitely kind of more, we want to make sure it's relevant and, you know, relates to what you're applying for. Yeah, I would say there's no need for high school stuff at this point. If you're four years into college or even three years, you should have some something on there. I love that you use your um, pool analogy. Uh, my analogy that I give, so again, it, it, we all are going to state it depends on the program. So 
uh, say you're coming into my finance program, which is a program that we don't emphasize work experience. It's helpful if you have it, but we would be okay if you came straight from undergrad. You know, I went straight from undergrad to a master's and I think it's the best thing I ever did. And if you feel that way as well, you know, you still want to make sure you highlight the work experiences that you have. Even if you don't have work experience, I guarantee you have some kind of experience you can highlight. So the example I would use is if you were a lifeguard at a pool, that's great. I don't know what it has to do with finance, though. Sure, you saved a couple people. We're glad about that. But really, what does it have to do with finance? Oh, were you a leader? Did you train people? Were you in charge of the financial budgets for restocking the candy stand? Did you help implement a new training schedule? Did you help uh, create new programs for the community? You know, did you do more than just sit at a, a, on a chair guarding people's lives? Uh, if you did more than just those minimum details, or if you're doing something you think is not relevant, start thinking of ways to take advantage of those situations you're in. You don't, you don't just flip burgers, you're part of a team, you're part of a group. So I look for teamwork, leadership, and experiences like that. It's not always about, did you work at a teller line and did you exchange cash uh, correctly every day? Clearly that's important, but it's about finding, I, I always say there's three skills that I specifically look for. It's about finding leadership, finding teamwork, and bouncing back from, from either adversity or problems. So if you had a situation where um, things didn't go your way, how did you fix it? How did you solve it? How did you make sure uh, an implementation happened to make sure nothing bad happened again? How did you bounce back from failure? Um, so those are all situations that can easily be put on a resume. So if you're a lifeguard at a pool, Tell me more, I don't, you know, I'm sorry, I don't want to sound crass, I don't care about the lives that you saved, I clearly do. Um, but I want to know more about the other parts of that job that make you stand out. Those are the skills that you can put on your resume. So I don't buy that no one has work experience. And I don't buy your only experiences came from high school. You, you clearly have every opportunity to have relevant experiences in any capacity that highlight those things. And again, talking with us, I will tell you all of that and let you know so that way your essay, or your, sorry, your um, CVs are giving me that content information um, because that's what I'm looking for. It's not always about titles, not always about jobs, but it's more of the, the depths of what you do. I'll say just real quick, not much to add to resume, um, but it, it's a tool for you as well, right? So you're submitting it for admission, but for instance at Babson, once you submit your resume and if you're accepted, those resumes go right to the Center for Career Development. And they go there because, depending on the program, you're only there for nine months to a year, maybe in B at BAPS, maybe two years max. So they want to get your resume. They want to look at it. They're the ones that are going to help you get a job afterwards. So the fact that you can format a resume, simple as that. It's not bright yellow. You know, it, it, you know things yeah, like that. Um, <laughs> there are AI tools now that employers use to scan resumes. Well, now grad schools are using them to mm -hmm. prep your resume so that when, when you're done and ready to apply for a job, it's ready to go. So... You know, it's it's also about how you format your resume and just simple things like that, um, keywords you use, things like that. So besides getting all the experience and when you don't have experience what to add, just know that it's going to be a tool for you in grad school. So it's a tool that can be developed, it can be changed, you don't have to be set in its ways. That's all I have to add. If you're not good at formatting, and, and again, it goes to that, that word detail that was mentioned earlier, even formatting, like a typo, I can, I can overlook one or two goofs. But if we're talking about, I can't even read your resume because it's 14 pages long right. and there's stuff on here I will never read. I literally have told someone who gave me a 14 page resume, I said, please resubmit this and get it down to one page, two max. They didn't, I did deny them because they could not follow directions. And frankly, everything they had was not relevant anyway. But you have to realize we're going through thousands of applications every single year. I have to be able to clearly and cleanly see relevant work experience, and basic information on there. Go to your, your career services to ha have uh, help in figuring out what format to use. Use, use a Word uh, tool, but it needs to be clean, it needs to be concise, it needs to be easy to read for us. Since there's a lot of you going to PhDs, um, this is all really relevant information for the professional programs. On the research side, they only care about one thing, research. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're applying to a PhD program, 
you want a CV that's got research on it. And you don't have to be first author on a bunch of papers. If you're fourth author on a bunch of stuff, that's great. You know, volunteer in the labs, as we're talking about. If you can get published, great. If you can present at conferences, great. Not every undergrad has the same opportunities to do all those things. So as I mentioned before, if you volunteer or just kind of do something a little outside the box, anything that builds that, faculty want to see that you have the ability to do research. And sometimes you may not have the academic opportunity to do that but do it as much as you possibly can. Um, because that work experience, you know, even for research, as much as they care, you know, you're talking about saving lead people and everything, they care about all that stuff. But in terms of getting you admitted to a PhD program, your work experience is largely irrelevant. They want to know that you can perform well in the classroom and do research, follow instructions, know how to properly format an APA or otherwise. All of those things are going to be most critical for those of you going to PhD programs. So I would just... Yeah. Pile your time into research. You know, forget the part-time gig at Starbucks. If you can <laughs> pour more time in research, that's going to be better off. And you might have two or three different copies yeah. of your resume. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I clearly, in business school, I want work experience. Research is nice. You can list it, but in like a sense, like a line. I don't need to know all the extensiveness of your research, but I need to know your work experience. And clearly, there's other programs out there that, that emphasize the opposite. So don't be surprised if you have two or three different versions of your resume uh, to highlight different areas. It's no different than, f this is kind of like finding a job. Mm -hmm. It is no different than if you, if we were Google, Apple, Amazon. Uh, Warmer? <laughs> just, just <check>. <laughs> and <laughs> FedEx or whomever. You Samsung. Oh. <laughs> you Samsung. <laughs> you know, you're, you're clearly, n I hope you would never submit the exact same resume to all of those companies because uh, that, that just will not do. So make sure you, you're also, again, talking with us understanding the program you're interested in applying to, working with those and giving advice from those who have had experiences enough to say, this is what you should do. If you want to focus on research, go more on that, uh, that direction. If you want more something on the specialty masters, uh, focus more on the experiences. It just craft it, but get your research and figure out what is the best uh, option for that. So I'm just going to ask you guys one more question, and then what we're going to do is actually just open it up for one-on-one -on -one conversations, if you guys would like to, um, and questions. So my last question to you is just if there's anything that you haven't shared at this point, are there any additional pieces of advice that you kind of burning to say? <laughs> I think we've covered a lot. I think the biggest thing is definitely for you guys to do your homework when you're looking at your program. Like we said, it's a two-way street. As much as you want to come to us and we want you to be there, if it's not the right fit, you're not really going to get as much out of it as you would maybe somewhere else where you'd do better in a smaller env classroom environment or something like that. So look into the school, speak with admissions. This is exactly why we're here. We're here to help you out. We're here to answer any questions. We're here to set you up with faculty to talk about research more. Um, we're really just a great resource and it's important to just take advantage of us uh, when you are in the grad school process. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, questions, questions, questions. Uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, you should be doing your research. So if you're, if you're coming to me and you're saying, how long is your program? I'm sorry, that is information that's on our website, so you should do some preemptive research, but if you really genuinely are like, I just cannot figure this out, that's okay. I'm still here to help you no matter what. Um, there's no such thing as a stupid question, but you, you do need to understand that we are dealing with thousands of applications as well, so the best thing you do is put yourself in front of us, but be very concise. Um, do some research search in advance so you can really get down to the nitty gritty and ask for opportunities. Um, you know, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I know that's a bit far from, uh, you know, here in Connecticut, but we have opportunities to bring students out to our campus to visit. Um, it's not easy to just always go and visit a campus, which I always recommend you do if you can. But if it's an opportunity where you're like, man, I just can't get up there, uh, if I think you're a right fit for the program, I'm going to bring you out and we're going to see if there's a way we can get you out to campus. Um, I don't know if other schools have opportunity, but I do. So let's, let's see if that's something we can do. Um, but it's always about asking questions because you just never know what, what is out there. I'd rather, you, um, I'd rather you have all of the information from every program to make the best possible choice rather than um, ignorantly making the wrong decision and not recognizing until it's too late you, you chose wrong. Grad school is, is an asset for you guys and it's something extra you're doing, right? You go to undergrad, you pick your school, you do your four years. When you go to grad school, it's just so much about fit, you know. Babson's, you know, whatever, rank number one in entrepreneurship. Harvard has an entrepreneurship school. And do you want to go to Harvard just because it's Harvard? Go ahead. But, like, go to a class, visit a class. And once you get there, you're going to know if this is the place for you right away mm -hmm. at any of these schools. Like, visit. Put in the time. Put in the effort. You're making the investment for grad school. You know, we're looking for reasons to admit you. 
But you want to make sure you're going to the place where A, you're going to succeed, B, you're going to enjoy your time there, and you're going to come out with, with um, network and opportunities, and, and you're going to put it, as much into it as you want to get out of it. I mean, just don't pick a school because it's ranked number one. Like, go visit, see if it's a fit for you, see if you like the student, see if you like the professors, you know? I, that, that would be my biggest thing. Take the time out to try to visit the schools you're interested in. One thing we haven't touched on is financial aid, um, so I just, I'll touch on it very briefly and then we can talk more about it specifically. But those of you going on to PhD programs, when you hear grad school is paid for, you're largely talking about PhD programs. When you're talking about masters, which all of us offer, masters programs largely aren't funded. Um, you'll find scholarship opportunities in some of them, you'll find assistantship opportunities that pay for part of your schooling typically. Uh, I'm sure you've all had TAs teaching some of your classes here. TAs are typically doctoral students. They're getting funded because they're becoming TAs or RAs. So I'm sure you're familiar with that process. So as you're looking at graduate school, if you're going to PhDs, great, and you can have that funding opportunity. Typical funding might be like a full tuition scholarship and you get a twenty or $25,000 living stipend for the year. That's fairly common at the bigger doctoral programs. At master's programs, you might find some scholarships and things, but most master's students are paying for much of their expenses through federal student loans. And as an undergraduate, you can take, I think it was up to 7,000 or so in the federal Stafford loan now as a senior, um, you can take 20,500 as a graduate student because your parents are no longer part of your financial picture as a graduate student, masters or otherwise. Um, so when you're filling out the FAFSA, you're basically poor because you don't have a job. <laughs> so you get more money that way, which is kind of the benefit. Um, so you can get money that way. And also then the PLUS loan, which is the parent PLUS loan in undergrad, it's now just the PLUS loan for you. And you can borrow up to the cost of attendance, which helps you with all of your other expenses, miscellaneous and otherwise. Um, one thing to keep in mind, too, is that many of you might be going into disciplines where you can go work for a little while with your bachelor's. You don't have to go into a master's program. And one of the benefits of that is many industries have tuition remission in some cases, where they can pay you to go to Babson or pay you to go to Case Western. Um, so depending on what you're going into, ask about those options as well. Are there companies that you'll be considering that pay part of your tuition? Um, like if you're going to CJ, for example, to become a cop, most police departments, at least in the Northeast, pay for most, if not all, of your schooling. So students come back and pay nothing to us, but the police officers play, and the police departments pay us. So there's a lot of opportunity depending on which discipline you're going into, but ask those questions earlier so you can kind of plan out longer term how or that is going to too, if you're military yeah, veterans, military, yeah. yellow military. ribbon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and there are certain slot schools get for yellow ribbon, so you want to ask and make sure mm -hmm. the slot's open. Maybe you start a little later when the slot's reopen. Things like that to, to do investigate investigate on. Um, and just follow up what he said about part-time MBAs. If you do get tuition remission, like schools are usually flexible. You can take eight years to do an MBA at Babson if you want to. I don't recommend it if you, you know, have to. But if you, know, if you don't want to pay any of it and your company will pay for it, take the eight years. If you don't really want to fund it, you keeping a job, you're working, you're saving money, you're getting your degree. You'll get it eventually. Thank you so much for your time and, and all of your advice. Thank you.